I started with the photography when I was in high school, I guess, and I joined the photo society. And it was something completely different from what my parents are doing or my friends were doing. It was just something very joyful. And uh, it was a cool adventure because I was the youngest member of the society and I could see the works of the people who are traveling around the world and it was such a different and colorful and vibrant life and I was excited about it. And with the time I decided that maybe applying for Academy of Fine Arts will be the best idea. And then I did my BA in Poznań. But with the time I realized that photography is not necessarily what I want to do. And I was like already experimenting with video and performance. And then I joined the Miroslav Bałka studio and they gave me a freedom I never had. It was a big luck that, I, that, I, that I've met Miroslav and then I become his assistant. When I was on my MA I already started like exhibiting worldwide. So it went smoothly. And after I, I finished my, my, my work with Miroslav, I, I started my PhD studies. And at that point, like, I'm very satisfied. Uh, when I decided to, to move to London, I was at this point that, that I felt that I need a change, that I need a different air to breathe in a way. And uh, for many years, I was thinking about moving to London, but I never wanted to do it. Uh, to do it just like that. And when I started my PhD studies, I, was, uh, I had this strong idea that I can use it as an opportunity to move somewhere. And uh, London came back again after a very long process of applying and being considered by the, uh, by the professors here. They said, OK, so you are more than welcome to come here. And that was, a, that was a proper reason to come here. Basically, it was students exchange. So I was student, visiting student researcher here. Uh, they allowed me to come here for three months. But after two months, they, they said that I can stay for a whole academic year. Uh, I know that you're working on a new work now involving roller skating. Yeah. here in London. Is it your PhD project? Yeah, yeah, that's my PhD project. I was struggling a bit with my presence here. I was constantly following the political situation in Poland. I was facing upcoming bre Brexit. I just realized that my presence here is not innocent. And uh, the whole PhD and the whole project from the beginning was related to the space of the fear, so-called, let's say, space of the fear, and to the power and the mass. I was referring to Elias Canetti book. It was really important to me to transfer all those, all this theoretical research to my practical work. And all of a sudden, I invented this figure of inline skating female Polish soldier. And uh, I know it's a kind of absurd figure. I think that the final piece will be this strange attractor, this female soldier skating in a very particular place in London. But something weird, something unexpected, which, which is appearing and disappearing. So it's sort of like, like a dream which never happened, or maybe happened, or maybe not happened, you never know. So. But that's basically what I like about art, that it's not obvious every time. And this art piece should be like that. So if you are aware and if you, are, if you have luck, you might see her somewhere. But she will appear and disappear and, and, and that's it. That's a moment, that's a, that's a second. And uh, I'm very interested both in the visual side, but also in the uh, how it affects the regular people who are, you know, who are on the street, uh, what they might think about it, how they might react. Of course, I will never know that because I will not be like running uh, and asking them questions and interviewing them. No, not at all. But it's something I wanted to, I want to give in a way, something different, something which will like this disturb their daily routine. I'm an artist and I'm fighting for this idea that people can actually find a time for art. 
and if and I will be trying to find any solution to do it. So that's that's one of the one that's one of the options to, to come to them. What is the significance of a female soldier roller skating in the city? Basically I was working with a with a uniform military uniform and uh, and the military itself for a long time mostly because uh, because my father is a soldier and my grandfather is a soldier when I'm feeling unsure about something or I have doubts where I should go I'm always like calling them and I have this relaxing chat about about <laughs> military uh, structures and uh, how it is how it is uh, to work in the military service. There is something very tempting about it, like the discipline and the structure itself. They were never working as soldiers who are going for a mission or something. My father is working more as an instructor. He's he's working in a in a military school, let's say. But with the time, I understood that uh, that the uniform itself is a representation of very particular things, and it's easily recognizable. So somehow, as a female, especially in the Polish context, I'm not allowed to use uh, those uh, those symbols. It's not very popular for a woman to be a soldier. When I'm thinking about those items representative for the power, the uniform is something very natural for me. I thought that I can uh, appropriate somehow this, this symbol and use it in my art. And I'm a skater myself, so, so, so when I was thinking about skating, about the soldier, I was playing with the symbols of the of the soldiers, I realized that I can merge those two things and I can create the figure of inline skating soldier. I might use this very tempting figure and, and place it here as a representation of, of my state in a way, of being somewhere in between, of uh, being here and there and not being sure if I am anywhere. <laughs> uh, could you tell me about your recent projects in relation to migration, actually, a melody of nostalgia that you made very recently in Birmingham. Melody of nostalgia is the first project which I've made here in UK, and it was a part of Supersonic Festival, and it was supported by Centrala Gallery. So, may, basically, I was invited to to make a project. And I thought that this context of a supersonic festival, which is a like music festival, is a good idea to push myself to the field of sound art. And I was already doing a research around my family history, which is related to Second World War and, uh, and my great-grandmother. So, making long story short, she lived in a house in Silesia, which is the south part of Poland. And the house during Second World War was occupied by Third Reich soldiers. But with the time it appeared that they are not Germans, but Austrians actually. And they allowed my family to stay in the house. But they had to move to cellar. And uh, my grand grandmother realized that the soldiers are constantly listening to the same song, which was very patriotic and very nostalgic song about beautiful Austrian lake, Bodensee. So I found this relation quite obvious between those two sides, let's say, between my great-grandmother and her family and those soldiers. So they both were living in a part of, uh, of their own home or homeland, but they felt a strong feeling of nostalgia. So when I moved here to Great Britain, I found myself in the position of the migrant officially for the first time in my life. And uh, I thought about this history and about context of this music piece. And I thought, okay, so I can make project around it. So I merged somehow the experience of my great grandmother and you know, the history and myself. And I decided to create sort of the u universal melody of nostalgia. And I started to making a collection of the nostalgic pieces sang by uh, Eastern European migrant women around the world. 
and I created small database and then I worked with a music designer, so we combined all those melodies sang by Eastern European migrant women and we created one, one piece which was, uh, which was played during the exhibition or during the performance. And I also invited and created and invited actually the male, that's important, male choir. And they, they were performing live. So the main part was this piece sang by women but I was looking also for male narration to fulfill the whole piece. It was easier to make a collection of the music pieces than to, to, to work with a male choir. At the very end, the many, many meetings, many hours spent together, we found a way how to create this balance, how to create one voice, and it was very beautiful. It was difficult to get in contact with all those women migrants, but luckily we have a social media and Facebook was very helpful and also people were asking their friends and, uh, and you know, the, the members of their families. So I used the social media as a, as a part of, you know, getting in touch with the women around the world. And then from the other hand, I had to find uh, the male, male choir. So I had few field visits in uh, Birmingham and finally I was able to, to create seventh person choir, male choir. It was also very important that all of those people were uh, professional musicians or composers, so they were working with music. And it was nice to give them sort of the freedom and to work with them and to create this piece together. What kind of songs they were nostalgic about? I was surprised by the material I received from the people, because obviously the part of it was, uh, was in Polish, so I could understand it. Uh, part of it was in English and uh, part of it was without any words. It was absolutely a variety of songs. So I have something which I could recognize as a pop, uh, pop songs from 90s, for example. But I also found a few very folk pieces which I didn't know, that they were from very certain parts of Poland, for example. And I was surprised by it. I never thought about folk songs being nostalgic. And I don't know every single person who sent me the piece, so I can't say exactly how old were they, but I think at least half of the, half of the collection was uh, recorded by the people of my age, maybe slightly older or slightly younger, but still around my age. The crucial part of the project was that the women will saw, sing or whistle, they will, they, will, they will do it by themselves, they will sing by themselves those songs which in their feelings are related to nostalgia feeling. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm a woman, and most of the time, I'm, most of the time, I'm working with a delegated performance. I thought that it would be nice if I will invite men to, to not support but to join women, to give them a chance to be vulnerable and to be emotional too, being with them, discussing about the piece sometimes explaining why they can't sing louder. It would be easier, you know, I can create a piece which is fully performed by the women, it has this strong feministic uh, drive in it, it's powerful and it's like, it's right. But I, I don't feel like I want to exclude half of the society, you know, from the, from the dialogue about the f 
you know, about literally about female voice. Mm -hmm. At least seven guys was participated something very beautiful with women and create they, they, they created something beautiful with them. I need a like universal or representation of a man here. And it doesn't matter if they are Polish or if they are British. I just need a man who will be brave enough to face the situation. Do you think being a migrant woman from Eastern Europe does it affect you? The whole situation is much more complicated. So, yeah, I, I have the status of being Eastern European migrant at the moment. But, you know, I'm from millennials generation. We are moving constantly. I just move another time in my life, you know. Okay, I move to different, uh, to different country, but still it's like a part of my regular routine, life routine. I'm still in a privileged position, you know. I can always go back to Warsaw. Uh, I ask myself a few times, why am I doing ephemeral art? And I thought that maybe at some point it's related to this, to this position of constant movement. And I thought that, that creating artwork which is ephemeral is more suitable to, the, to our times than, you know, creating a solid monument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you are interested in, um, very much interested in history, memory, um, which in my opinion is some sort of a symptom or characteristic of Polish art. And you found yourself here in London doing this uh, non-commercial work. Uh, and London is one of the most commercial places in the, in the world in terms of art. What was your first kind of uh, impression of this art world? Stupid me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew when I'm moving, I knew what I'm doing, I knew what I can offer and I, at some point, I knew what I can get. So it's not a secret that uh, that London is highly commercialized place and you have all those, you know, art fairs, commercial galleries and all this circuit which is not very suitable for my art practice but that's the exciting part of it. When I moved to London I knew I need a, I need a new air, I, I have to like I want to be surprised because I want to like a different experience, different way of thinking about art, to see it, how, how, you know, how other artists are struggling, maybe with the topics similar like me or, you know, how they are commenting their reality. That is exciting for me to be here and to see it. Still, I'm learning from it. I can't avoid that it is existing and hopefully I will be a part of it in the future. But but right now I just want to focus about like developing my own um, my own path to be to be a performative artist and work with time based art. There is a place for it. This is like institutional circuit and uh, uh, public galleries maybe. You just need a time to explore it and to work towards it, and that's it. Would you like to tell me a bit more about your life here in London? Yeah. Want, I, mean, <laughs> okay. I know you prepared something. No, right? I, don't, I didn't. I don't <laughs> How would you describe your life in London? Actually, it's fully packed right now. I never felt so busy as now. Now I understand what people mean by saying that they have absolutely no time. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, life in London is very expensive. <laughs> it is expensive. It's not a myth. So I, at the beginning, I had a small scholarship which allowed me to have this very comfortable, super comfortable situation of studying, sitting in a studio, and uh, making a research and working uh, on my projects. But I had to find a job, so 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 now I have a part-time job. So Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays I'm spending at Notting Hill, working ten hours per day because I have to pay for my rent. And uh, the rest of the week, which is like four days, 
I'm spending in the studio space and still like trying to 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 to, to work out my 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 projects. So it's kind of tense time for me because I have only four days to like make a research, read, uh, watch, uh, visit galleries, meet with the people and uh, I hope it will pay me back so my day starts at 7 a.m. and it ends up at midnight and I can't extend it like I can't I can't yeah I can't I can't more work more I'm doing my best but I found cycling as a very as a very important part of my daily routine because I'm mostly using a bike in London I'm not using public transport I don't like it and cycling is is amazing thing because I'm spending two hours during the day only cycling in the urban space of the London creating this this rhythm of the city experiencing it and that's the time when I'm with my thoughts and the most creative ideas are appearing while while I'm cycling so it's very precious to have it <laughs> at the moment we are at Slade uh, where you still have your studio. Yeah. Uh, we actually had a look at your studio earlier. Could you tell me a little bit more about that space? Being here at Slate was one of the most exciting things which happened to me. And the cool thing about being PhD students here is that you have a studio space here, which is shareable with other PhD students, but that makes the whole thing even more exciting. I was sharing the studio with uh, amazing artists who were painters, bio artists, uh, artists who are working with the food, the sculptors, the filmmakers. It was a very creative environment. You could feel the energy, the creative energy. And uh, yeah, I'm allowed to stay there only till the end of this month. So right now I'm just, you know, counting my days, <laughs> which is a very unpleasant feeling. So I will, I will have to find a new studio space outside of nice and warm academic structures and walls. <laughs> uh, you make performance, so in a way I would think that maybe you don't need a studio. Why is it important for you to have it? There is something very important about having your own space where you can gather your own thoughts. No matter what you are doing, studio space is a space when you can feel free as an artist and you can experiment. So people are experimenting with uh, sculpturing materials and I'm experimenting with my thoughts and my ideas. That's the place where I can really develop my idea, especially that I'm working with a, as a conceptual artist. And from the other hand, I'm surrounded by other artists and I can, you know, see how they are working, uh, what they are doing, what's, what is the rhythm of their work. And it's also very inspiring. One of the last questions about um, the art world here in, the, in London. Uh, if you could think about it, then like, could you place yourself within, within this art world? It's kind of difficult for me to answer this question because I just moved here, like 11 months in the, new, in the new country. It's not a lot of time. But from the beginning I knew that institutional circuit is something which interests me the most. Right now I'm just, I'm just learning how it works actually. I'm just observing it. I'm trying to be a part of it, and I'm like, you know, I'm doing everything to be a part of a of vibrant British art scene. I'm doing projects. I'm meeting with the people, and uh, that's all very important for me.